Hello everybody, welcome to episode 7 of City Talk. This week we are delighted to be joined by former Cork City midfielder George O'Callaghan. Welcome George. Thank you Dace, nice to be on, I've been enjoying your shows. Appreciate that, appreciate it. Um, so just to give you a kind of run through of this week's episode, we're going to catch up with uh, Georgie on his uh, varied uh, footballing career, his spells with Cork City and across the water and even further afield. We're going to catch up with Georgie about life just after football and, and kind of what he's been up to now. Uh, we're going to again get some, a lot of questions from the fans in this week, Georgie. So I think uh, they're, they're really looking forward to it. And uh, again, as usual, play maybe a couple of games at the end uh, and wrap it up. So, um, Georgie, how are you getting on? Maybe we can kind of reverse that and start off with kind of what you're up to now. Obviously, COVID-19 has been difficult for everyone, but maybe give people who might know an update of what you've been up to at the moment outside of the football world. Um, well, I uh, opened a 24-hour gym in Ballincollig, so we were about five days from opening before the, yeah. uh, the lockdown happened. So uh, today, I know, funny enough, is the first day we're back. Builders yeah. are just finishing off the last few things and hoping to be open next week. So, um, yeah, these just kind of got involved in the... Like in the gym world, fitness world, you know, I find it, yeah. it's been great for me in the lockdown because obviously I had the gym, so I've been in the gym two or three times or two Brilliant. or three hours a week or a, a day every every week. So uh, I'm nearly fit enough to come back. So if you can tell Fenny later, <laughs> <laughs> there's always a spot for your job. Do you know that? But um, could tell us how 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 did you get into that? And you know, like how did you kind of find your way into the the gym world or the fitness world? How did that come about? I was kind of looking to be involved in something like that for a while, just with the fitness side and the the healthy well-being really decent so um it kind of came up um anytime fitness is a franchise and uh gar Hulahan, uh contacted me and the lads and said would i be interested and you know i kind of came in like as the general manager and uh it's kind of a project that we started it was like a building site and we've gone through the whole lot so i've been here since day one and it's yeah. kind of exciting though you know as even walking around there earlier on it's all taking shape now and it's all coming together so it's yeah. exciting now that you know next week uh people will be able to come in and see the gym and do you know, our, our, um, our gym's all about, like, you know, healthy well-being. Like, we sponsor a lot, like, um, the wheelchair, Irish Wheelchair Association mm-hmm. and all these good causes, you know. So, uh, yeah. it's just a nice environment to be in, uh, these, you know, kind of like, you know, I've worked in the football agency world and in the dirty business and football for long enough. Yeah. So, it's nice to just have a nice, nice job where uh, you look forward to going in the morning and, you know, I kind of, and I'm here myself, so I end up working out and keep myself healthy yeah. as well. So it's good. And uh, I know we spoke uh, a, a couple of months back before you did start the role, just kind of myself and yourself, and you were looking at different options within the kind of football world. But obviously, you've taken this path. Was that a conscious decision? Decision that you've made, you know, to look at maybe something else outside of football? Um, yeah, I think so, and I think it's just nice to have a nice job, nine to five job for a change. Yeah, I think with the football and job, it's like. It's very taxing as well, you know, and, yeah, yeah. you know, when you're dealing with football agencies or academies and all that, like, I think it's nice to yeah. get a break from it. It's, it's something that I definitely, um, I've had a lot of contact recently to go back in and be involved. Like, I've had clubs from England contact me. I have a call today with a couple of clubs in England. But, you know, at the minute, I'm just really happy to be doing the gym. And, um, you know, football always catches up with me, no matter how much I try to get away from it. I'll be <laughs> back involved in it, so... Yeah. So I know eventually I'll be back involved. Never say again. never. Yeah, because I know one of the things you mentioned was just a bit of stability, really. was something that you mentioned to me at the time. And, and that offers, you know, obviously with the, the nine to five role and stuff like that, something a bit different that you've probably been used to most your life, I'd imagine. Yeah, like, at least you know yourself, like when you're playing soccer, when you're involved in the soccer world, whether, whether you're playing or you're managing yeah. or you're an agent, you never switch off because yeah, you're yeah. 24 hours on your, in your brain, you know. So, yeah, yeah. like with my job here, I come in the morning, I do my job. I get my car, I go home, I can go home and chill out with the family, get you know, so I'm not stressing yeah. about calls coming in at 10 or 11 o'clock, lads looking for contracts or yeah, Pat yeah. Dolan ringing where I am. Or... <laughs> <laughs> A regular occurrence, I'd imagine. <laughs> but, uh, okay, look, we kind of, what we usually do is kind of take a run through of, of your career, I suppose, and bring it back to this point. So, um, you know, you're, you're a young footballer in Cork, you're starting off. Who did you play with underage? Uh, obviously, you moved to Port Vale and stuff like that. You know, kind of tell us a bit about that, what age you were and, and so on. Well, like, I kind of came from a hurling background with my right. family. So, um, basically, I was kind of like the old traditional thing for hurlers was that you play uh, soccer uh, during the winter just to right. keep yourself fit for the season, kind right. of following like what my brother used to. 
Right. But um, when I was about 10, actually, Paddy Kassan, who ended up playing for the, uh, he won the all Ireland for the Cork footballers in uh, 2010. Yeah. Paddy asked me to go up and have a game up in Rockmount. And I went up and played in Rockmount, and they put me up centre forward, and I got a few goals. Play, I was in the 10s, playing the under 11s. And I ended up having a couple of years at Rockmount. I loved kind of got it, getting into the soccer, but I was still more or less playing the hurling. And then when I got to 12s, uh, I, I signed for Leeds, who had a fantastic team at the time. They used to win everything in the, the cup and the league every year. And I kind of got into it that way. And then the football kind of, kind of became more of a love to me than the hurling. Yeah. So, and then all of a sudden, when I got to about 14, 15, I kind of grew a lot. I kind of got a lot taller, got a lot stronger. I think I got a little bit more streetwise hanging around the city boys in the... Uh, in Val of Land, I um, I just kind of just ended up kind of getting better than all the other lads, and yeah. then I kind of had interest from scouts. Um, I know I could have went to Liverpool, but my uh, my mum and dad had friends of the family in Stoke, and they were yeah. friends with the director of Port Vale, and they asked me to come over. Right. So, I, what, um, what league would they, would they have been at the time? So at the time, Port Vale were a really good club. They were in the championship at the time, so right. they were always yeah. in the top ten, like top eight in the championship every season. Mm-hmm. So um, I kind of went there. I never forget actually. So I went there in October, and the U team were uh, were at the, were playing in the U Cup that night, and the reserves had played the night before. So I ended up training with the first team. All right. So John Rudge uh, brought me in and uh, trimmed me up with the first team. I didn't know any of the first team because you wouldn't know any championship players. Certainly, yeah, yeah. Them there. wouldn't get the coverage as it does now. So we warmed up, and there was a fellow Lee Glover. He used to play from a striker, but he used to play with Roy Keane. So right. Lee Glover kind of took me under his wing because I had the SM yeah. accent as right. <laughs> and uh, we warmed up, but then they threw the ball. We had a seven aside, and they threw the ball out to me, and I just ran through the whole team and scored. Jeez. And then they let me play for two or three minutes later, and then John Rudge took me off the pitch, and he went, right, come back to my office, back to his office. He rang my mum and said, right, we'll keep him, we'll sign him. So Jeez. they signed me uh, that and day. You were, you were 15 then, was it? 15, yeah, 15 and over the, there. I, I suppose we got the kind of the mentality of... Garrod, when it was time for him to go over, and even Roy, two different kind of mentalities looking into kind of going across channel. What we were taught at the time, you know, with school and so on and so forth, but was that, was football for you, that was what what you wanted to do, like, you know? Yeah, well, I think initially when it came up and John Rudge said he wanted to sign me, the first thing you're just thinking, I'm going to be a footballer. You don't think about the homesickness. Yeah. You don't think about leaving family, going over, living in a different country. Yeah. So for me, the whole buzz of it, I just went home to my mum and said, right, mum, I'm going to England. Uh, that's me finished. Uh, yeah. So I couldn't wait to get over there. Right. But then then when you get over there and like the first week or two kind of passes and then it's get into the months, then the homesickness does kick in right. and you start thinking. Yeah. And do you know what? It's a hard world over, especially when we went because the U team wasn't things, didn't have the the guidance or the protection that they have now. You know, we were basically yeah. just throwing in digs, giving a bus pass, £40 a week. And you're in and you're cleaning the the stadium from nine o'clock, out trading, back, finish, clean the change rooms after the lads, finish at five o'clock. Like some days there was dust on the walls and the big corridor in Port Fell. Our right. manager, Mark Grew, would bring us out and run us around the track until we all got sick. So it was like hard, different was times. hard going. Yeah, different times and it was hard going, you know. And do you, th- do you stuff- think that's missing in football a bit now or do you think it was too extreme back then? You know, like even Roy spoke last week, you were skivvies to the first team basically, like so you know, wash the boots and so on and so forth. It's gone full circle now. Obviously, younger players, they're, they're, they're pampered as much as the first team, if anything else. Do you think it's gone too extreme now? Or, you know, do you think it's... Do you think maybe a balance is right? Yeah. Like, there probably is a balance where they are protected a bit more and they probably don't get the chance to... I don't know, kind of, to grow up in that tough environment. Do you know what I mean? And, right. and I, do, I do think you find players that are really good players, but they're just mentally weak. But I think yeah. when you lived in, back then... You just had to get out and play, do your stuff, or otherwise you didn't survive. And the stuff that we were put through kind of made you stronger as a person. Some of it was off the walls, like totally illegal. But you either had to do it or you didn't. Like, and yeah. I had plenty of lads that came over to us that didn't last. It only last two or three months and they'd be gone. But right. I suppose when I was there, I just wanted to be a footballer so much. It didn't matter what happened to me. I just I would, I would go through anything. Like, you could say, go through a brick wall. And it didn't matter what happened, what yeah. people said to me or what was going on in the changing rooms. I just wanted to be a footballer. Yeah. And uh, where where were you in Port Vale at the time? When you went over first, were you straight into the first team? Or were you again, were you in the youths and reserves and stuff like that? Or Yeah, I basically just went straight into the youth team. So, okay. um, like, normally the lads had an apprenticeship, two, two-year apprenticeships with uh, Port Vale. But John Rudge wanted to sign me, so I ended up having a three-year apprenticeship. So I was there, like, longer than all the other lads. Right. So um, it wasn't until 
like I really struggled for a while in the youth team. Like say my second year, I kind of wanted to come home. I rang my dad one day and said like Dad, I want to go home. And my dad okay. flew over and I played against Nottingham Forest. I scored a couple of goals. And my dad said, see you at the end of the season. Right. And he goes, and then we'll see what we're going to do after that. And then I came home, kind of had the summer. And then I said, listen, it's my last year over in England. I'll go back. I'll have a bit of crack with the lads and kick on. Mm. And as soon as I went back in that pre-season and relax and enjoy these, by the time I knew when I was in the first team, you know, and right, then everything exactly. was starting to explode for me. You were a bit more relaxed, you reckon? So going into that year, probably soon did you a bit more? Yeah, a bit more relaxed. And do you know me? Like, I've always been skinny as well. Like, I was starting to, like, mm. not... not yeah, daddy bigger, but like I was you know, yeah, starting I know to get stronger on myself and yeah. I was able to deal with the lads a bit more and I suppose you need that banter in the changing room where you can brush fellas off and I suppose I was starting to come one of the older guys in the youth team so I was more respected right. and yeah, because I was getting in with the first team then like the first team lads were like look, were looking upon me as a new lad coming through because I was getting in the Irish squads and all that kind of stuff so yeah, yeah, you know it all worked that way Brilliant and I suppose t- take us through that kind of I think you came back to City in 2002. Where were you at the point in, in Port Vale, that you kind of decided, look, you've had enough or you're going to leave or whatever happened, like, you know? See, Port Vale is a really tough one and I never ever, I think I'll never get over these. Right. Because I got in the first team, I could have went to Arsenal, they put a bid in for me and they ended up signing Jermaine Pennant instead of me because they bid a million and, and John Rudge wanted two million. So I went into John Rudge and said, Rudge, I want to go to, to Arsenal. He was like, you're not going to Arsenal. You've always been here with me. You're not going to play in front of Petit Vieira. So I listened to John Rudge and I stayed there. And what age uh, were you then, George? I was 18. So they ended Jeez. up signing Jermaine Pennant instead of me. Uh, Arsenal. Um, so I didn't have no advice then. Uh, these, right. you know, like, I used to be going to the phone boxes ringing my mum and dad. And my mum and dad aren't football people. You know, course, yeah. We come from the country in White Church. So I was kind of dealing with it all on my own, kind of trusting... I suppose being in the GA, kind of in a parish and poor fair was that kind of family environment that you just stick yeah. in and, and you do what your manager says. And right. I, I kind of, under, that's the way I understood the way it rolls. And then unfortunately, Rudgy got sacked okay. when I was in the first team and Brian Horton came in. But Brian Horton didn't take me one bit. So I basically went from being the first team, he put me back in with the U teams and the reserves. So it took me a year to get back into the, to the first team. Um, and then I got back into the first team and I played about, I think it was about the last 15 games in the championship and John Rudge rang me he was after going to Stoke he rang me and said oh uh, David Pleats rang he wants you to go to Tottenham and I was like oh Jeez. I've just got off a new one year contract off uh, Port Vale he goes well he goes I goes what should you do he, he said he goes sit and think about it and I put the phone down my phone rang about 10 minutes later in my house it was uh, Brian Hart and he goes oh we want to give you a two year contract and double your money but I knew Tottenham were in for me so then I rang Rudgy back and Rudgy said, you know what, stay another year with Port Vale. He goes, you won't get in the Tottenham first team at the minute. You're still too young. And then um, I ended up taking a two-year deal with Port Vale. Uh, came back that pre-season and uh, I, sc- I think I scored three goals in the first two, two or three games. Then we lost to Cardiff after about seven or eight games and Brian Hart never picked me again. So uh, and then- It's just so funny, even Roy touched on it last week. Like... It- it just it's it's so fickle over there, like isn't it? You get just get a manager that takes there or doesn't, and it can make or break your whole career, like can't it? Yeah, and I heard Roy said, and it's exactly right. You just need a manager, fancy, and I had that with John Rudge. I was his type right. of lad. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I was kind of built in there with him. I was yeah. like the kind of future of the club in his eyes, and then you kind of come in, a new manager comes in, and he's totally different ideas. He went out and spent half a million on midfielders we didn't need that I could have done the job on for a club yeah. that couldn't afford to spend it, and uh, yeah, so then. I kind of sat there, uh, decent. and to be honest, I didn't deal with it personally well. Right. So I just ended up going out all the time because I couldn't deal with the stress of it. I felt like I was failing everyone at home. Right. I was I was playing. Like, Missing in, out on the opportunity of going to Arsenal Spurs, like that must eat away at, at anyone, like you know, and especially yeah. then find yourself out of the team. And then I'm sitting, and we got relegated to League One, and I'm playing League One, and not even getting in the squad. And okay. then you know just. I just literally lost the plot as a person. Like I just I couldn't deal with it, and I was hiding away. I wouldn't answer phones from anyone at home. I'd like ring them. Like I used to speak every day. I might speak like once a week and say, "No, I'm fine," but it wasn't fine, you know. Yeah. And then the, my thing with the club back then, we had no guidance, and then my youth team manager became the system manager. Like they must have known there was something wrong with me. Right. Do you know what I mean? And this is ultimately I'm responsible for my own actions. But yeah. the club, the club should have known and pulled me inside and said, "Listen, George, what is going on? Like you're living on your yeah. own." Nobody called to my house to see what was going on in my house and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then these basically within a year, well, I said within about 18 months, I'm supposed to go to Tottenham. Poor fellow were paying up my contract to get rid of me. So 
and then we were we were struggling League One. I didn't really, I think Carlisle kind of came in for me when Roddy Collins was there and yeah. that wasn't going to work out. And then I just came home and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I kind of came home. Yeah, so what was your thought process? You would have, did you, were you just kind of in total limbo at the time? Like you just didn't know what you wanted to do with yourself? Like, because I know, like with Joe and, and, and a few of the others, they were kind of saying, look, get home, get yourself together, or get back playing. But you seem to be kind of even lost even more. So, you know, did you, you didn't think, let's stay in England and, and fight it out. You just came home kind of a bit lost, did you? Yeah, and like, I think people forget, like when they think about my career, I had seven years in Port Vale, and there were right. seven tough years, you know, dealing as a footballer, getting through the whole lot and getting yeah, the first yeah. teams and all that. Like, people yeah. forget that side of my career because they kind of everyone looks at it from Cork City on. Yeah. But when I came back, it didn't bother me if I played or not. Again, right. please. Um, like, you would have been in what, your early 20s then, was it? It was like 22, 23. Yeah. So, um, and then, you came back and obviously your ne- your next move came to City. How how did that come about? I think it was Liam Murphy was the manager at the time, is it? Yeah, so I don't know who contacted me. So I think Murph contacted me and I met uh, Murph in Canty's bar in in town. It's a sign and, of the uh, team, so. Murph came in with a Euro, calc- uh, Euro converter calculator. <laughs> <laughs> I sat down. <laughs> and uh, more far from me, the equivalent of whatever English pounds was 340 euro a week. Right, okay. And uh, so I'm kind of sitting there thinking, geez, I could have been at Arsenal or Tottenham like oh, a year geez. ago. I know Morph was here with a euro converter <laughs> signing me for Cork City for 340 euro a week. <laughs> but that's my offer that I had. And then yeah. I was actually after getting into the hurling again, I was after like getting okay. called up to the Cork uh, intermediate team. So I played hurling for about four or five weeks while I was uh, waiting for the season to get back with Cork City. Okay. And I kind of had an offer of a job in the fire brigade. And I was going to take that and just concentrate on the hurling. And I was thinking, I'll just forget the soccer world. It doesn't suit me. Yeah. And then my big brother just rang me one day and he said, listen, George, you're a soccer player. Like, he goes, have right. one more go at soccer. He goes, go back this year uh, and go play like go play uh, for Cork City. And uh, even my first <laughs> in my first game with Cork City, I didn't even have football boots. My brother, my brother went down to Blackpool and brought me up a pair of boots. He was like, "There, he just goes, just get out and play with you." And then yeah. I was like, "All right," like, and he dropped me off. Like, so. But I suppose did it suit you being home and all that kind of stuff? Then you know, like uh, being at home, be a bit more comfortable, kind of gave you a good platform maybe to kind of kick on, really. Yeah, and that's the thing. Because like, then I was back up. My mum and dad, I had that base. My family around me. I didn't. Yeah. All my family then were after realizing what I was actually going through, and so yeah. they were all there to help me, you know. Um, but like in saying that, then I still had, I had that that kind of that kind of noise in my head, like like I should be like I should be playing like yeah. in the championship in England, I should be in the Premier League, I shouldn't be yeah. here, you know that kind of way. And yeah, you felt it was a bit of a downgrade, basically, like did you? Yeah, and it, like it definitely wasn't because it saved my career. But looking back, my view at the, at the time, time was I was yeah. completely a failure, like. What am I doing? Like I'm back at Cork City now. Like you know what I mean? And like Cork City wasn't great them days. You know, like all the lads be smoking yeah. on the back of the bus. Yeah. You, you know the way it was. Like it was just, we were yeah, training, I know, up, yeah. training up regional park. Like like with dog shit everywhere. Like yeah, yeah. you're thinking, oh my god. But do you know what? For some reason, I kind of we had a good bunch of young lads came into Cork City at that time, and we well, all kind of that became was friends. kind of a bit of a transitional period for the club. Like really, wasn't it? You know when. When Liam took over that time, he had a lot of younger players like yourself, and then you know there was jo- uh, John O'Flynn, yeah, you know, David Warren, you know, a lot of good players coming through at the time. It was kind of a restart, really, like wasn't it? Yeah, and, and like I th- we went away from pre-season, and we had good lads like Conor O'Grady was there, you know, yeah. Greg O'Halloran was there, yeah. you know, you had I'll the older like... lads like Decky and, and Napier, but like. The kind of younger lads kind of all kind of kind of noticed straight away they all hung out together we all kind of socialized together and and, and started like just being friends so i ended up not even like playing for yeah. professional soccer it was just like yeah. playing with your friends at the weekends that kind yeah. of way you know what i mean like and, and we kind of had the crack we all hang out like we were part-time so we were only chain tuesdays and thursdays that are you know twice a week in the evenings yeah playing on a friday night or a saturday or sunday so yeah but it just became just it just a bit kind of was just something magical that it just all came together and that and was the kind of platform for it really like that those years like the 2002s trees or whatever like that it kind of set up for the success of the next couple of years like didn't it because it was really a home-based squad more or less like wasn't it you know yourself you know john o'flynn gamble came back greg you know like ben o you know mick devine nulls is there a real hoggy a real kind of home-based squad like was which probably was 
the strength of it as well. Like, yeah, and, and then that's what it was. And I think I think the biggest thing for me in in that first year definitely was Flinny, because yeah. uh, people will always say me and Flinny kind of like started off the new era and all that. Yeah. But Flinny was so good that I used playing number ten, and I was still I was still at the stage where I didn't care if I played soccer or not. So I was still always reckless. Right, okay. And I think that kind of summed up my performances. Like I could be magic one day, yeah. or I'll do anything on the pitch. Like do you know what I mean? I didn't care. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I'd try any trick or I do anything. I, I kind of became like like kind of a stylish number ten because I would just, yeah. just go and just like be trying to do like flicks or I'd do a trick in training and I'd be like, oh, I'll do that in the match. Yeah. And then I was at any time I passed the ball to Flinny, he nearly scored. <laughs> so and then I had so we were sort of. And he was kind me. of now he was in a similar position, I'd imagine. It, Headspace wise, coming back from England and all that kind of stuff as well. Like, so you kind of, you know, your similar age, similar paths were after taking. So it probably suited you really, like, did it? Yeah, I did. And like, we had a great friendship. And I still think, you know, then you had the Decky Dailies and the Stephen Napiers that you respected, that we like, I got to watch yeah. in the cross myself. Yeah. So you've nothing but like the utmost respect for them. You had the older lads, Woodsy was after coming back in. So yeah. you, you kind of knew you couldn't mess around. Mm-hmm. Because they would pull you, like, and you didn't want to leave him down, especially Decky. Yeah. When I was playing for Decky, you didn't want to let him down on the pitch. Yeah. So I kind of got to think then where all of a sudden we're all over the place, you know, it's kind of like that kind of fires after coming back into Cork soccer. Yeah. You know, the media are starting to take attention of us, like we're starting to get respected a bit more and all that. So, and then it just went went from strength to strength after that. And uh, again, then I suppose kicking on from that, the foundations were laid and, and, and Pat came in then and the kind of all railroad from there really like didn't it and uh, yeah, it did. I know you spoke a lot about him he had a big influence on, on your own career and, and that, on that team as well like yeah well Pat made that team do you yeah. know and I don't think people forget like Murph signed really good players lucky or not he signed yeah. some really good players like he, his signings were unbelievable yeah um, but Pat just took it to another level like you know and the professionalism came in yeah. um, like Lennox put the money behind it yeah. Um but Pat was Pat, Pat like made that team, you know, like, and a lot of those he, players. He kind of he he reinvented the club in a way as well at the time, like didn't he? You know, like he was he was like the brand ambassador as well as the manager, like he was everywhere, and you know the rebel army and all that kind of stuff. That yeah, you know, like it it, it goes unnoticed sometimes, but he rejuvenated the whole club, like you know, he was really the the face of the club at the time and all that kind of stuff. Like he was brilliant, like wasn't he? Yeah, like Pat was a genius and everything. Like even that now, like I know you're on the marketing side and all that. Like yeah, oh Pat yeah, you look at it now, like he done some, Yeah, exactly. Like you look at it now, like he was literally kind of doing it all himself, really. But he was a larger than life character. Like it was just natural for him, like wasn't it? Yeah, and like the thing was, they he kind of brought in Dave Mahealy, like you know, like sports scientist. Yeah. Like we had a sports psychologist. Like we had everything. Do you know what yeah. I mean? When you it was look the start back, of, was that the start of you going down to UL and all that and using yeah. the facilities down there and stuff like that? I know the lads are saying them tough yeah. times, but yeah. it just showed the kind of what he was looking for professional wise, like, isn't it? Yeah, and like, and like, geez, I don't know how much like they spent on the finance or how much he blagged to get people just to do stuff for free for us or whatever. Yeah. But like, when you look back, like, we were way ahead of everyone then. We were starting to like, you know, be way more advanced than all the other clubs and what we were doing, yeah. what we were training, you know, uh, even our pre matches, getting ready for games. Like it sometimes was a bit extreme, but that's the way I think Pat kind of ha- knew he had those younger lads. And I think the second and third year, uh, Decky kind of retired and Napier and the lads that had jobs because they knew they couldn't keep up with what we were doing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which was a shame, but you know, it was kind of it was, it was kind of a new a new era, and, and that's what yeah. we brought it through and brought it through. And uh, you know, Pat Pat was brilliant, and uh, as I say, like you know, you can always rely on Pat. Like, like, like you should see my text messages to him on my phone. I'd do his <laughs> head in. Like, anytime he texts me, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, Pat. Like, and I'm the only one that's ever cheeky to him. And he calls nuts. You're the only so, one who gets yeah. away with it. He hasn't spoke to me for about two weeks now, but I get a text now again in the next week or two. And then, I've, and then I'll start up again. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, and I suppose, did, did, at the time, the team were really kind of on an upward curve, really. I think he finished maybe fourth, second, third, second, or something like that. And then obviously, unfortunately, Path kind of left the club after the 2004 season and then Damien came in. How, how did you find that? I'd imagine you were sad to see Pat go on all that, but how yeah. was it at the time? Because obviously you went on to kick on to some good things as well. Did the lads ever tell you the story when Pat left? No. Told. Oh, no. 
I don't know, I threw about two or three chairs at everyone in the in Rochestown Park. I did it was murder in the chair, or in down Rochestown Park in the meeting. You weren't but, happy. Um, I didn't want Pat to go. And I still think, right, if Pat didn't go and Pat stayed, Cork City would have had, would it be like that, Jordan, like the Michael Jordan thing? They would have won six or seven leagues yeah. in a row. And I, I did speak good. to Joe about that. Um, uh, like, if you do, if you just look, if you look back on that team, like, and the core team that you had from maybe two thousand and whatever four until up to two thousand and eight, really, you know, the core players were always kind of there, like you know, Flinny yourself, uh, Gamble, uh, Moza, you know, Benno, uh, Hoggy, Morph. Uh, Mick Devine, the core of the team were, was always there, Colin O'Brien, Woodsy, you know, it, do you feel like that team underachieved in regards to what, like, I know you won the league in 2005, the FEI Cup in 2007, the Santa Cup 2008, but, like, it could have won a lot more, like, do you think? It totally underachieved like this, like, you know, um, but if you look at it, like, it kind of got to the stage where, I think, was there about 13 of that squad went to England? From back yeah. to playing England, yeah. like that's that's mental. Like, like even Dundalk couldn't even do that now. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. And, um, Shows it. We um, is it, but it's typical of Cork football. I think if you always look down through the history of, of us in Cork and Cork soccer, we always like implode. Something happens and right. teams yeah, go. Yeah, even and, the um, even the management turnover, you know, was a lot even over those couple of years. Like, wasn't it? You know, yeah, you went from the morph to past to. To Rico, to Alamachu, you know, Paul Doolin, in the space of like whatever that is, six, seven years, four or five managers, it's it's a huge turnover, like, isn't it? Yeah, cause, see, when Rico came in, it all la- it all relaxed. Yeah. You know, what I mean? even Mick, right? Mick was so afraid, Mick Devine was so afraid of Pat, he would be in every day doing 40 minutes on the trail an hour on the trail <laughs> to lose his body's fat. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that all stopped. When Rico, when Rico came in, they were out playing golf. Right, okay. Right. And at the time, I was trying to stay as professional as I could. Like, I was about two years off the drink. Right. Off going out to nightclubs, off everything. Right. And Rico's come in, and then it's all just laxed. So I didn't have that structure that Pat had for me. I didn't was kind of on my own. Like, Joe, Joe said, like, from a tactical point of view, he needed more of the Rico or whatever. Do, do you think you needed, uh, like, a, a character like Pat to keep you in line? Obviously, because you said you can tend to go maybe waywards off the pitch sometimes, but... Yeah. You'd, you need a patch, you reckon, or that kind of a disciplinarian to keep you in line? Yeah, I, I think 100%. If Pat stayed there, everyone would have stayed on it. Because if mm. you look at look at Mick, Mick, Mick was the best. When well, Mick was right with Pat, and all, and not just picking on Mick, yeah, Mick was unbelievable in 2005 yeah. and 2006. But anything like that, it, 80, after 80 months, when things lax and people start taking out the easy options, like mm. 80 months, it all falls apart. Even if you're a footballer yourself and you take, you take like, the foot off the pedal, you see that 18 months, you see it all unraveling. You get away with it for about a year, and then it just all, just all slowly, just go and erode out. And I, and that, and I could see that happening when I was right. with Rico. Like even when in the cup final, like I guess Cork City fans who were watching, telling me, like, oh, George, you remember, like, we were in the league and uh, we won the league, and we were on Havana Browns and we were all celebrating. I wasn't out celebrating. I was at home. Right. Like so, all the other boys were out. Right. Like and then we we could have won a double easy, and then we went up to Dublin, and as if we were like. Like we were like LA Galaxy, like in the, in the yeah. hotel. Yeah, it was all ridiculous, good. And like you know what I mean. And, and I think it was kind of it went back to being the social days of Cork City, where everyone has a drink the night before mm. and all this stuff. And it shouldn't have happened. You know what I mean. And that's yeah. what, that was my problem with it, because I knew then it was affecting me as well personally. And and I was like, oh well, what's the point of me even trying anymore if this is the way it is? Like I might as well just be like go back to what I used to be doing because mm. I don't see nothing coming out of it. Yeah. So I was kind of then starting to crack in my own head during the whole lot of it like you know mm. the most important thing was that we won the league but yeah. after that then I was thinking what's the point like we've won the league now and like and it goes this I can see where it's going but so. I suppose uh, like we had Roy in on last week and it just shows that everyone is is a bit different in their own way like Roy obviously said last week that you know under Rico he thrived because that was the kind of player he was that he just needed freedom yeah. to go and play his own game like you know Roy was direct you know pacey attacking straightforward game like you know whereas like Joe was saying tactically he might have needed more but maybe now looking back on it he thinks the you know the relaxed style and the kind of free flow and style might be suited to the team as well would you agree with that or I see I know it's easy for the lad it's easy for Roy and Joe to say that because they done really well in them periods do you know what I mean? yeah. 
and you, okay. you can't get away from the fact that Roy and Joe are brilliant footballers as well. So yeah. does it, and it didn't matter where Roy and Joe would have been because two of them are really professional as well. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's for the lads that aren't professional right. that were going to struggle. So Joe and Roy are never going to have a problem. They're always going to be the way they are. I guess it yeah. was the la- other lads around it that right. needed the guidance and anything like 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 these weeks play in in Europe. We right. wouldn't do a set piece. Right. We don't want to do team shape. We wouldn't know who we're playing against. Do you know right. what I mean? And I, I look back, like I watched the, the Your Gardens game uh, last Friday night with the lads in Cairns those. And I'm thinking to myself, like, we just went out and played. And if you watch the first 45 minutes of that, like, we're not like defending or nothing. Like, we're just playing the way we played League of Ireland. Yeah, yeah. You know, and like, we played Slavia Prague after that and we got absolutely roasted. But like, right. we had no set up. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. they must be looking at us going, like, what is this team? Like, Sunday League yeah. team, like, they're all over the place. So, yeah. That's and what they, I feel. And I know, but like football, I suppose, it has really gone 360 in the last number of years, hasn't it? Though, like, you know, in regards to tactics and all that kind of stuff, it, was, it wasn't it was as tactical maybe back then, do you think? Or, you know, like it, football in general, like obviously we would have been exposed to the Premier League when we were younger and stuff like that. Mostly we wouldn't have really seen the other leagues around Europe and stuff like that. But, you know, like it, it seemed a lot simpler game than it is now. And I know I keep touching on it like the last couple of weeks, but... It, w- it wasn't really a tactical game. It was four four two, get yeah. the ball up the pitch, you know, and play it from there. Balls in the box, you know. It was yeah. more. It was probably a bit more flair to it, really. I heard you say that in one of your interviews that recently. It's, it's very true. That's what it was. You win the battle in midfield. If you win the battle in midfield, you win the game. That's what Patsy yeah. Frame used to always say to me. Yeah. And that's the way. That's the way it was. Like I, like my my uh, my son comes home from training or from matches now, and he'd be like, "Oh, I got two assists." Yeah. Uh, like, Sister are like goals, aren't they? These yeah, like, when we, we ever speak like that years ago, you know yeah, what I mean? I know, it's, I know it's great to have it now, but I'd be like, oh, yeah, like, I was like, geez, I used to assist a load of goals and nobody would say nothing to me. <laughs> I scored the goals, that got his credit. Do you know yeah, what I mean? It was, it was. I, I used to be setting up goals everywhere, and then I'd be thinking, at the end of my career, I'd start thinking, I better start scoring goals here instead of trying to set them up all the time. <laughs> I know, yeah, or else recant all the assists that you made. I used to actually be playing in matches and I'd be thinking, how many goals can I get Flinny today now? Like, can we get yeah, Flinny up yeah. the charts, be, be crow and burn? That's what I used to be thinking You're playing in the wrong era, George, you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, look, obviously then, you, I think you moved on from Cork City then. You know, there was the fallout. Obviously, you know, even from your comments there, you, you probably didn't see eye to eye with Rico on, uh, on, a kind of, on a playing level. So, but look, moving to Ipswich Town, who were a huge club, you know, yeah. a bigger club at the time then they probably are now. And like like you say they're Port Vale, like if you think of Port Vale, probably people listening to this are probably thinking who. But they yeah. were a massive club at the time, you know, in the championship. Roy was speaking about Coventry last week. And if you think of Coventry now, you're probably thinking, you know, it's a you know, a middle of the road club in England or whatever. But at the time, huge club, like, you know, and the same with Ipswich at the time, even a bigger club or whatever like that. Now you know they're kind of in the championship or whatever at the moment and uh but at the time you know they were kind of not far off the premier league so going there was a big move for yourself was that something that you felt you needed a fresh start or would you have been you know what, what were you kind of thinking at the time leaving city um uh, i think i had it in my head from when i started signing for Cork city that i have to go back to england because of what happened in port Vale. but like during my city days then days as you know Everyone kind of looked at me, kind of like I kind of had the wild reputation or this yeah. kind of the kind of bad boy reputation. Yeah. So, and I think about it when I look back at it now. You know better because you work in the market. It. Mm. I was actually marketed myself unbelievable in the League of Ireland. Yeah. Like if you picked up a paper uh, on a Friday or a yeah. Saturday, I'd be definitely on the back page. I'd be like, be all about me. Some mm. sometimes I'd be in trouble. I'd be on the front page. You were like, a journal stream, to be fair. So and I didn't have Instagram and all that. But everyone yeah. knew who I was, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. I was actually creating this big persona that I still have to live with to this day that I shouldn't have, you know what I mean? Because yeah, people yeah. only look up as me as Georgie back then. Yeah. So I was kind of living in that. So then the kind of move for Ipswich came. I could have went to Celtic. Right. That I was supposed to go there. And then that fell through the last minute because you got in track and it signed Borgo and I left back from Burnley and the fans didn't take them. They drew four each in their first game. So they were supposed to buy me for 100 grand. That fell through. And then I filled out with Rico because my head was getting melted. I wanted to go. And then Ipswich rang and said, Call, come over. Let's have a look. Yeah. And then same thing. First day of training, Jimmy Jilton brought me in and said, like, we want to sign you. Brilliant. But Ipswich, amazing club. Like, you know, yeah. it's got everything. Training ground. Portman Road's beautiful. Uh, it's all, all kind of football stadium. Yeah. And I was thinking, right, I'm back now where I belong. Back in the championship. Big club. Bit of a chance to get into the Premier League if you can get in the mm. playoffs. 
But then these, I walked in the door, signed my contract, and there's a fella, Charlie Woods. He was Bobby, with Bobby Robson at the time with, with the FEI. And I walked in and Charlie Woods has looked at me and gone, all oh, my friends in the FEI rang me about you, you're a bad egg. Jeez. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, like, I'm never going to get away from like, being yeah. like Georgie. Like. And then the following day, the UT manager got, oh, I got a call from Port Vale about you the other day and your behaviour. So oh. then I was thinking, oh, for, oh what am I going to do? Is like, that what it's like in football? Like, you, you know, is, is that, do you reckon it was like yourself was a special case or whatever? But do you reckon, is that something that happens in football? Stigma follows players around the place, like, you know, is that yeah, the norm? Yeah, completely. That's the way it is. That, like, because all so the managers are talk, talking to each other, managers are agents, whatever. But I mean, you got to think, like, there isn't a whole lot of managers in, the, in England when you, when you look at all the players there and yeah. all the scouts and all that. They all, they all talk and they all do their stuff. Yeah. So then I was, I was fighting that battle with Ipswich as soon as I went in there. And then sums me up, then I got sent off on my debut mm. oh, against yeah. uh, Watford in the FA Cup. So then straight away then, like, it's, all it's my reputation's like, coming out in the papers in England. And then I got caught drink driving in 2004, and I put it back for four years, and then I had to take the ban. So I, w- I flew home and told them I was going home to, for a speeding charge, and then I came back, it was all over the sun in England. Oh, got ruined in all the papers here. Right. And then, like, after that, then I was kind of fighting knuckle back, like, you know what I mean? I played matches. Like, like I played matches for Ipswich. Like, I remember we played against Barnsley. Like we were one each, I scored, we went 2-1, we ended up winning 5-2, I got man the match. And the next game I wasn't even in the squad for Sheffield Wednesday. Right. Like even my last game we played Plymouth away, we drew one each. You you think that the only person that you'd need to worry about really would be Jim Magilton, but is that people feeding into his air then affecting that, do you think, or or what, what kind of happens in that scenario? Yeah, I, I knew I knew with Jim, I knew with Jim there was people in the background like saying not to play me, you know. Right. And that's why I kinda of got that sense and I was like, Oh geez, like what am I gonna do? And then, um, like, I know who it was. Like, I, I didn't know exactly who it was, like, two people that were doing it. So, and then you got to think, we've kind of have, uh, or it's like we had, like, a really good academy coming through. Right. So they, the lads that were kind of promoted from academy directors up to the first team, they wanted their academy boys coming in because it's making yeah. them look good. And that. then, on top of that, these as well, they got meningitis. Oh, yeah. So I had meningitis, like, that, for months and that. months. And I knew... I knew playing, like I, was, I came back after about three or four months and my head used to be spinning in games. I shouldn't have been on the pitch. Mm. So it took, me, it took me like the whole pre-season or like a whole like six, seven months to get back playing the way I know I could play. Yeah. But, but by then, then they'd sent me on loan to Brighton. So, right. yeah. And uh, yeah, so you talk about your move to Brighton there, obviously at the time even they were transcending, you know, into a, you know, looking to kind of kick on as a big club and how how was your time there? Did you, 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 did you spend the season there, or, or? I, I just went there from. <laughs> there's always a story that you know. Uh, uh, this they, podcast will be good for the roof, I think. <laughs> they, um, I went there at the start of the season. I lasted to Christmas. Right. I I actually played my best football ever, at my whole career at Brighton. Like, uh, yeah. like I went went there. We were, we were actually in League One at the time. We were they were getting ready to go into the new stadium, and like. I, I used to just cruise through League One games. Like, there was a bother. I wouldn't even break sweat and I'd like, be the best player all the time. Yeah. It was like the way I was at the end of Cork City. Like, yeah. I could just cruise through midfield, nobody get near me. And then I kind of suppose I got that sense that I was like Georgie at Cork City that was right. at Brighton. Right. So then Brighton offered me a four year contract okay. and to be club captain. So while I was doing it, uh, we had Dean Hanman that plays for, that went on to have a great career at Southampton. Yeah. We had Tommy Elphick, um, we had Bad Savage, like all really good footballers. But the lads were young and they were messing right. them around the contracts, the chairman. Okay. So we lost on on St. Stephen's as like Boxing Day over there on uh, 3 0 to Millwall away. It was the worst result we had. We were just we were terrible. But about three or four of the lads knew our contracts were up and they weren't going to be signed. So right. after the game, I got interviewed and I said, Well, I wouldn't worry about my contract. I'd worry about the rest of the lads, the younger lads. They should be looked after. I goes, I'll always be fine. I goes, I've been in football long enough. Nice. I'd done that. And by the time I got back to Brighton, the chairman was gone ballistic, oh. went like crazy at me. And mm. then uh, I ended up then um, coming back to Cork. Cork City. Yeah. So you, you signed back for Alan Matthews in 2008, was this? Yeah. So, it, it, it seemed to be a bit of a turbulent season from, from the outset. Do you, do you think, again, that your, your head probably wasn't in the right place again after maybe taking a step back, after taking this, maybe two steps back after you took, took a step forward kind of thing? 
Yeah, well, I was like, I came back these, right? I think people forget about this. I was top goal scorer when I left, 11 goals, like yeah. in that short period. I was you you got off the right flyer wing. that year, didn't you? The moon he was flying it and all that as well. But like, not, not, not when I was playing these, because we right. were barely scraping over games. And if you look right, at the results, yeah. I was getting the goals. We were winning 1 right. 0 against Shamit Rovers. I was like nicking goals everywhere yeah. that we're playing in the Santa Cup and all that. Mm. But I kind of came back, and as soon as I walked back into Bishopstone, into the training ground, I was like, what have I done? Right, okay. Like, yeah. But it was a massive money. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, like yeah, I was on huge, tough. huge money. Like I was like, there was no one ever got paid. But I got paid in the League of Ireland. Like, yeah. And I was like, oh my god, like what have I done? And then, uh, like, we had so many midfielders. I was thrown out in the right wing. Oh yeah. Like I was like with Alan, like like why like I should be playing centre midfield. Like I'm not a right winger. Like I don't have the pace for it. Yeah. And then it just started cracking in, and then I was thinking, Jesus, I should have just stayed in England. I worked so hard all those yeah. years to get back, and I went back in the same situation and playing up in UCD in front of 50 people. Mm. Do you know what I mean? The only good times were when we played the cross, so we had like a big game against Drogheda because Shelburne yeah, were yeah. starting to go then as well. There was no Shelburne right. around to kind of get yeah. you going. And I kind of sensed it and I knew myself, like, and like I had a daughter on the way and I was like, what am I going to do? And it's it just that feel that I had with Cork City was gone, you know, that we had before. Yeah. I thought yeah. it all just come back and it had totally changed. Um, and then I was just like, right, I'm going to get out of it. So I was like, I said that mm. in one day, I was, I don't want to be here anymore, like, I want to go back to England. So, yeah, so you you went back with the uh, Tranmere Tran Rovers, was it? So back like, to Tranmere. Back to Tranmere, and um, it was like you seem to just pop around in a couple of clubs the years yeah. after that. You you never really kind of settled anywhere after you know after your your spell with Cork City those couple of years. Like you, were you just unhappy? Like you know, did you did, find you know what do you think kind of led to that? Do you know that 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 day when I had that call? with Dean Wilkins and Ipswich my career was over I was oh, finished yeah. with football I was yeah. like 28 I was like I have enough I don't want to do this no more yeah. like I had no love for it anymore like because I kind of felt I kind of felt one of the reasons going back to Cork City I thought well I'll come back I'll be Georgie the buzz will be back everyone loves me in Cork like people still were after turning against me a little bit yeah. I couldn't really do anything right like I wasn't and then I was back to my old habits where I was like it's like any job these if you're pissed off in your head you're just going to go for a few points you're like oh, I yeah, can't yeah. cope with this I can't and I'm not good at dealing with stress in my head anyway so yeah. I was just back to my, my old like stupid self not doing not being professional and then I kind of knew it was over do you know what I mean I went back yeah. to Tranmere <clears throat> yeah so you Tranmere Dundalk Yeovil Wadford you know you absolutely I, I think I heard you mention before you were just kind of bumped around paycheck to paycheck really like was that was that you know like I, I, I wouldn't imagine you had any huge love for those clubs really like was it a, kind of just a job at that time yeah totally decent like and the thing was because I had a name I was still getting really good money you yeah know? yeah um like what else are you supposed to do like I had no education coming out of it I was trying to like yeah. learn a bit of business in the background trying to kind of get away from football yeah. but like I knew my I knew my heart and soul that I was finished you know what I mean I knew in games like everything was coming like and if, like I could feel in my head even in matches like I just wanted to get it over with like I'll oh, just get this over with today like I'm kind of walk around the pitch and like wait 90 minutes just get this done and then we're done like for like another few days yeah so, and then uh, obviously be- uh, you came back to Cork City in 2010 when when Tommy was there and again like oh, I would have been there at the time yeah your, your head wasn't really in it then either like was it this could be like a Kino at MUFC rant okay? <laughs> <laughs> this, this video could be buried <laughs> But uh, we'll just say that, uh, you know, like, obviously, it was probably the wrong time and wrong place for both parties, like, wasn't it? You know, like, we had uh, a lot of, it was basically you team kind at the time. Yeah, Maybe Greg, Lordy and Nultz, and then obviously yourself came back. But, you know, as, as I said, it was probably wrong place, wrong time for, for both parties. Like, like this, I knew, like, that, like, I knew, like, where my career had gone and all the clubs mm. been, I knew I was way better than that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And then I like, can put back in a situation where I'm basically back on scratch at 30 years of age yeah. with Cork City that I was doing when I was 22. And I knew that was a long process again. Yeah, like, yeah. And I was going to have to deal with everything. Like, yeah. like I couldn't really afford to do it. Like, like because Rocky was coming on the scene then and I had two kids and a family. Mm. Like, I was like, man, how am I going to deal with this? Like, and yeah. like, like, I know people said Tommy's a great coach. I just could not do any more of those drills. Like, you know what I mean? Like, just yeah. constant passing drills, drills, like, I was getting too old to do new team football, you know what I mean? Because I've been through like a whole I, lot of years. I, I felt as like, 
when you were actually on the training pitch though with the players and even for myself you you were you were good like around the players and stuff like that even giving advice and helping players and saying come on like you need to kind of walk on this or you were always trying to help people out or even like when I was leaving you were like you know trying to sort out a couple of clubs you know like there was always goodness behind it really like it, it, that was kind of you were always a very good you know cog in the squad I felt like you know because obviously the persona outside of the club really is that he's a troublemaker and he's disrupting the squad and look obviously you've had your run-ins with managers and a couple of managers would probably say different but as a fellow player and stuff like that you were spot on like you know especially with the younger players at the time like you know you were you were you were great like yeah but I was always like that and I was always the one that got in trouble for standing up for people or saying things that yeah. was none of my business and I'd be back enough for fellas and like I never had a problem with nobody playing because if I said something to you or I had a follow like I fell out with Joey, Roy, Flinny, all the lads, and I, I would tell them to their face, I go, This is what I think of you today. And I would tell them, I think, and then it's done. The next day I come in, I go, No bother, like, sure, you know how I felt about it. And if I was wrong, I'd say, Sorry, well, listen, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Uh-huh. Or I think they like, you can know, only, but people wanted to have this stigma about me that they say what they want, and Georgie does this and that. Like, like it's not my fault the clubs were throwing money at me to sign from when I didn't want to play it. Really, what, what was I supposed to do? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, like, when it was there, I used to try, you know what I mean? Like, up in Dundalk, like, I just couldn't cope playing for another team other than Cork City. Yeah. And I just, I didn't want to be there. I felt like a traitor all the time when I played for other teams, you know what I mean? And I wanted to be, I, I was like, I'm a Cork lad, I don't belong here. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I know love. I think Joe, you know I mean? Joe Gamble kind of had said that when he moved to Limerick, like, it, it was a bit of a job. Like, it wasn't really, like, he didn't love, well... He said he grew to like Limerick and all that, but he didn't love it like, let's say, his hometown club. And I suppose there's always a bit of that, really, when you're playing in your own country, like, is there? Yeah, and the thing with me, Dees, is, right, like, Pat Dolan used to always say, like, he goes, all the lads can be, like, Porsches or Mercedes, but he goes, you're like a Formula One car. He goes, mm. if there's one tiny thing wrong with that, he goes, the whole thing blows up and there's no point yeah, in yeah. you being, you know, and that's the way it was. Yeah. Like, I had to be all in and, like, firing. Or if, if I was something niggling in me, then like I just couldn't cope with it. Like you know what I mean? I would kind of build up and build up until I explode out of it. So, so then I suppose after the kind of couple of moves around again, uh, I think you spent time at Cambridge, but you went out kind of out to Asia then, and uh, with DPMM where Joe and Roy ended up. Were you playing there at 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 first, or did you always yeah. go there as a as a? I don't know, was it the general manager or CEO or whatever you were at the time? No, with myself and Greg. Uh, O'Halloran went, went down the lash and Greg you know those coin internet machines you can put money into yeah Greg goes close your eyes and uh, and uh, when I when, when I say stop point your uh, finger on the screen and we'll find an agent and see can we get you a move Jeez. so Greg that and we find a fella called Kevin Horton in in England and uh, I rang him up and, like, and he knew where he was and he said oh like do you want to go to, I goes I want to go abroad I don't want to play like in England or in nice. Ireland and he's like oh I can get you to Brunei same as Joey says, and I was like, where's Brunei? Like, yeah. And uh, I was like, Grant, so they were just back from a ban, uh, DPMM, the team in Brunei. Right. They were banned for like some illegal thing. So I was the first, I went back, I scored a hat trick in the game against the uh, like against the national team against another kind of like yeah, yeah, local yeah. game, scored a hat trick. So they signed me. So I went there. I went there. They weren't in, registered in the Singapore league yet. So I flew out with Rocky, who's like 10 months, Sadie and yeah, my wife yeah. Emma. I landed in a hotel in Brunei now, right? And these guys, if you're not on their cases, they don't care where you are, where you're staying, what your life's like. Like, right. it could be the worst conditions. Right. So I kind of there. So then I kind of changed the culture in Brunei with Steve King. But every day we would play a match in front of the Crown Prince. So yeah. 11 v 11 was our training session. All right. Warm up, 11 v 11. So, like, all the foreigners, all the import, or the, the local lads hated me because I was, like, the new yeah, okay. import player. They know I was getting away more money than them. Like, and they'd be like, oh, import, uh, yeah, loads, yeah. Of, loads of money, local, no money, you know? And then yeah, you'd hear yeah. the sirens of the Crown Prince coming down the road right. with, this, with, all the, with all the police around them. And I'd be like, oh, here's my, here's my salary, lads. Like, I was, like, widening them yeah. all up. Like, it's a great crack. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we used to play 11 v 11 every day, right? So I yeah. went there... Oh man, I went there in July and I say I played like I played like apart from a Sunday, I played eleven v eleven every day Jeez. in 35, 40 degrees heat over there. <laughs> so oh but then they brought in the other uh, four foreigners, but they had a coach, uh Simonich was there. But I wasn't his 
from his agency. Right, okay. The other four lads were. So what he started to do was he was bringing me in at seven o'clock in the morning and he just run me for about an hour and a half in the heat. Sure. But we and then like, I would, he would think like I'd be wrecked like and then I used to come in a train at five o'clock play eleven v eleven and my legs would be gone, yeah. and then he like he do like uh, hurdles as the warm up in front of the crown prince and my legs would be shaking. Yeah. And he knew what he was doing to get rid of me like and he'd be like right. throwing his hands yeah. up to the crown prince anytime I did something wrong. But after a while, I got just so fit that I was I was destroying the lads at the end. Yeah. And uh, so then I kind of knew I would they were going to get rid of me like so I was kind of thinking to Emma like. I was like, I don't, I, I don't really care if I stay here anymore or not. Like, Life, okay. so I was like, we'll have a holiday over Christmas. We'll do the whole thing, and then I goes, then I get out of my contract. So then um, it kind of got to the stage. Then it kind of got to January, February, and I said, listen, um, I was like, I said, the, I said to Crown Prince, I goes, he wants to replace me. He goes, yes, he wants to replace. He goes, well, replace me, like, but pay up my contract. Mm. So they paid up my contract, and I got on a flight the next day out of uh, for a night back right. to London. But as I was flying out, I was like, I'll come back and I'll get him. Do you know that? I said, right. I goes, I'll make sure I get that guy one of these days. So I flew back. I landed in heat or in um, I landed in um, Heathrow and it was snowing. Oh. So and I had like all I was actually get paid up cash. So M at a half, like we get book 60, 70 grand like, in a bag. And I was like to Emma, I was like, ah, let's just go to Lanzarote. It's snowing here. So I just went to Lanzarote and lived there for a year and just bought, just got, just rented a villa, just lived in Lanzarote for a year, thinking what I was going to do next. Not a bad option to have. Yeah. <laughs> so then, like you probably, obviously, you kind of, you went into the the football agency. Then after that, what did, what made you decide what kind of route you were going to go down? I suppose really, you know, like obviously when football was finished, they might have obviously look, it's outside of football, but inside the football, whether it be coaching, management. You decided to go down the agency route. Why was that? Did it start like, to stem back to your touchdown there or Port Vale a while ago where you felt you had no guidance? Kind of, yeah. when you were, was that where it kind of came from? Do you think? Yeah, and that was that was one of my my weaknesses as well as uh, being an agent when I got into it because I, I, I love coaching and I love managing, mm. but I love that. And the, but the agency side is, is a real good buzz out of it, yeah. you know what I mean? And I kind of looked what happened players and I kind of felt I understood players. Right. And I ended up working for a Russian guy, uh, Vasily Markov, like, you know, like, like multi, multi millionaire from oil. And he wanted to start up a soccer agency. Uh, and we had lovely offices in Piccadilly in London, man. It was class. Like, yeah, so yeah. I said to Vasily, I met Vasily with a chat and I kind of explained everything to him about my career and what I wanted to do with players and all that. And he was like, right, mm. give me a job. And the first thing I did was uh, email the Crown Prince and say, listen, you're, you're getting ripped off. All the players are from the same agent. They don't care about the club. They're all leaving after three months. They're all getting paid up. They're wasting so much money. Can I have a chance to? Yeah. Can I can I have a chance to come fix your club for you? Mm. So the first thing we did, we got Steve Keane and his manager. Got the other guy. <laughs> he was just after leaving Blackburn as a Premier League manager too, was he? Yeah. Keane Blackburn. had a rough time at Blackburn. No. Yeah, that's why right. Davinci took over and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But Keane was a really good coach, like Gamble and uh, Roy. will tell you that. Yeah. So like I landed up. I met Kino and I said to Kino, I said, Kino, this is the way this place runs. Like, it's nuts. Like, mm. we play matches every day. Like, everything is wrong. So, yeah, like, yeah. you have to change the whole lot. So, I, I, I lived with Kino for three weeks in Brunei. Yeah. And I, I kind of explained to him the way the culture was, what he needed to do, who he needed to look out for. Because you need to look out for people in Asia. Yeah. And then I got my chance to bring in the players. Right. So, Joey rang me and said he was thinking of retiring. And I was like, hold on, I'll get you a deal. Yeah. And, uh, I got Joey up and I told the Crown Prince loves Liverpool. Right. So I said to him, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Joe? Milner. Milner oh, yeah. from, uh, from Liverpool. I goes like, he's Milner, like, you know, I goes, reliable. And Joey looks a bit like Milner, if you think about it. He's got that stocky oh, build. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he was like, and he goes, every club needs him, you know. And like, I think Milner was at Man City at the time. He goes, but every club needs him. I goes, you need one player like him. Like, yeah, to the yeah. Crown Prince, like, and the Crown Prince bought into it. And right. to be fair, Joey came out, he was brilliant, like, in the trial yeah. matches and in training. He was like, he was way better than everyone else, anyway. But like, he didn't have the CV, like, Joey, he might tell you, like, lads I played in yeah. World Cups and played Paris Saint Germain. Yeah, Joey's actually come from Hartlepool. Yeah, so like, yeah, I yeah. had to do some blagging, like, with him to get it, like, just to make sure they knew Joey was better than, and Joey was better than all them. Yeah, and so then they had to find a marquee footballer, a striker. So I brought Franny Jeffers out, but Franny like came out unfit and all that. 
So they offered Franny a contract, and I said no to the Crown Prince. I said no. I goes, don't offer him a contract. And he goes, he's not fit. I goes, it won't right. work for him. Right. So then I, I kind of needed someone to rely on. And I know Roy was a brilliant footballer. So I rang Roy. Roy, yeah. as I said last week, he had that story. He was coming to the end. And I said, listen, pal, just go out and play 30 games. Get yourself fit, and we'll get you back to England. Mm. But Roy just took off. like He was brilliant. Like, oh, yeah. 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 And tell you what, now, to be Joey Gamble and Roy O'Donovan's agent is the hardest work in the world. <laughs> you're, sitting, you're sitting at home on a, Saturday, on a Sunday night and like at about three o'clock and the games the, their games are like eight hours ahead or so like about one o'clock yeah. and next day I get a text Joey's been sent off Joey's <laughs> been sent off or head, head button somebody I'm like oh my god straight to Heathrow ten o'clock flight out to Brunei 15 hour flight sit with the Crown Prince you don't understand Roy and Joe they're very competitive this is the way uh, football yeah. is there you need more guys like this oh Jeez. man but they were brilliant they were brilliant what they oh. did and they've done really well out of it yeah, and uh, you ended up signing uh, El Hadj Juff then after that. Oh yeah, then, then then I was working for a bank in working on football uh, club takeovers in uh, Singapore, so we we were doing a big move for a championship club, and then on top of that, I met the new director or the new owner of Saba. He rang me and we were sitting down, we were chatting, having dinner in Singapore, and. Um, he's came up and he started chatting about football and all that. So I, all I remember, it was such a posh dinner, these right. I remember having sea bass for my wedding. So I was like, oh, I'll just have sea bass, please. Like, you know what I mean? And they're all yeah. having wine, like, bonds yeah, of wine yeah. worth like six, seven hundred quid. Like, and he once came out with a fish, like, yeah. with eyes in it. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? Like, and I'm looking at him going, oh my God. Like, and I'm trying to sit there, debone a fish with eyes looking at me, chatting to him, going, oh my God, this is manky. <laughs> So, but I think he kind of knew and he started laughing and then we kind of got chatting about football and yeah. uh, he was he signed David Rollcastle years ago that's where he finished up his career okay. um, and he was like you know Rocky and I was like well I'm not Rocky's my son <laughs> and I was thinking Rocky Rocky who's Rocky and then I remember going David Rollcastle came to Malaysia and I was like oh David oh, Rollcastle yeah, yeah, yeah. and then we got into a big conversation about David Rollcastle and uh, he, asked, he asked me to come out and I, um, they asked me the job to be a uh, general manager and do what I did at do what I did at for a night. Okay. But uh oh I made so many mistakes these. Right. Signed a laugh Joff as one. <laughs> yeah. I remember and the second one is signing a laugh Joff as well. <laughs> so but we had great crack. He's obviously that. just out there for the pay day, I'd imagine, or whatever like that was this or Do you know what he came there with nothing, pal? And he just he he honestly like he act he, the way he's acted was just off the walls bad. Like, he could have made his money back in Asia. He made and Georgie he could... look like an angel in your in your prime did he? Oh, kid! Like, <laughs> I was like, I was like Liam Carney. <laughs> um, oh yeah, no, like, cause I was like, oh my god, like he was grand for the first, but he started going out for meals, and they all love Liverpool and right. all the I twelve, I've thirteen bosses who are all stars and politicians. Right. So you're out every night for dinner with them. Then they started taking him out. Then I knew there was trouble then because he was getting too big for his boots. Then, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And uh, but. Well, did- there's, a, there's kind of a gap then, I suppose, between the last year or two and kind of when did you finish up with Odin in, in age and stuff like that? Because maybe fill people in on what kind of you were doing in between that period or what were you doing or if anything. But, well, like the thing with it, when age, when I finished up, I was lucky because I'd that was the first time Carney became a coach. I brought Carney, I was a coach. Right, okay. So Carney came out and then we just kind of got into a situation. Carney wanted to go back. Right. To do another year with Cork City. I told him not to go. I was like, can't stay with me. <laughs> so lucky he went back. Yeah. And then um, it got really dodgy out there. And I, I was, I was living what, when, out there. When was then. this? How, how long ago was this? No, this would have been about four years ago. Oh, okay. 2016-ish. So, yeah. So then it kind of got to a situation. But what where, where else is this? I'm just going to say to you. When I went to Saba, right? Mm. the Irish media right, absolutely crucified me like, like, and I see fellas go out to Asia and, and it's like best of luck on 42.ie and all these websites yeah. they crucified me everywhere I went and like I left that job because there was you could not live there anymore like there was just too dodgy and you're talking about a club that had been thrown out mm. of football for throwing games and I wasn't right. getting involved in anything that was dodgy yeah. around, and I was like I'm out of here like I've done my time carney has gone home I've mm. got a big job waiting for me when I get back to London and it kind of went out that I just left because the, the boss wanted to be the new general manager and he decided he needed to pick a team, a guy that never seen a football match in his life. So when I left, I got on a flight and said, well, I'm going home and finished. And then I got crucified in the media here. It was like I went on the piss for a week with a Frazul, who was like a Muslim kid, who was the nicest kid you'll ever meet in your life. Right. Played a hundred times for Singapore, uh, like international footballer. 
to like it kind of looked like I was off thing and people kind of jumped on that bandwagon back right. in Ireland. You know what I mean? And that, and that kind of made me kind of think, Jesus, like, do I ever get a break off this stuff? You know? Right. So yeah. So then that's why then I I, I left and I went back to London. Okay. Did you go uh, back to the football agency then? Was yeah. It? Went back working for SEM. Okay. Uh, who were a big agency in the day, like with Jerome Anderson. You know, right. he built the Arsenal team in '98. Yeah. So I had a really good job there. The only thing with SEM was that Jerome was after doing so many dodgy deals with Blackburn and Steve got in there. Okay. Like he'd upset it, not dodgy deals, but he had upset a few people with deals. And then I was getting the brunt of it because I was after kind of taking over Jerome's position. Like, okay. so it was difficult, like, but it was a good learning curve. Like we did a lot of double production on the TVs. We did the Ireland and England game yeah. a few years ago um, on that and kind of stuff like that. Um, but then I kind of knew with SEM, there was no kind of longevity, longevity in it. So I decided William Hill, <laughs> the bookies, gave me like a business manager job. And then okay. I thought, great, I get into long contracts, learn about money. Yeah, yeah. Like, I know how bad gambling is. I wanted to see the whole side of it myself. Like, yeah. Because like, we were we were awful at gambling like, when we were at Cork yeah, City, yeah. like a load of us. So I wanted to see that kind of aspect of life. And uh, that was one of the best things I ever did, these, is go work for William Hill. Right. And then I was at William Hill there then for about 18 months, two years. But I, then I ended up being pushed to the football department. And then I'm dealing with teammates right. that were losing 300 grand and 400 grand at weekends. Okay. And I couldn't cope then, and I was cancelling accounts, and I was like, oh, man, it's time for me to get out of this. Like, Because basically, work. I'm trying to sell it to them, and I didn't want to be selling it to them, you know? Yeah, I get so, you. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. You there's, said, there's a book you, in there, at least. I'd imagine so, yeah. And so you decided to come home then? Was it was that about two years ago, was it? Or yeah, did you decide to we, settle back in Cork? The big thing about coming home was to get the kids' education. And yeah. that leaving Asia and, like, the UK was... The kids needed to settle down and go to school. You know, they've been traveling all over the world at least since they were like small. Like, yeah, the yeah. Rocky couldn't even walk by the time he went to Asia. So yeah, they need, they need, they needed like stabilities in their life. And we thought, right, we came home for a weekend and we're like, oh, we'll just come home like close to the family. And uh, like, I had a few things going on anyway with yeah. Ipswich and academies and all that kind of stuff. So I just came home, pal. And so the kids, and then do you know what yeah. I mean, just kind of have a good like life for them. Yeah, no, it's been it's been great to see you around the cross again for the last year or two or whatever like that. And I know you're doing a bit of media work with with yeah. Red FM and stuff like that. So it is. It, it's it, been, it's it was been tough for me to go back, back these, right? Because I was upset with people for a long time. You know what I mean? Right. And I think like I couldn't make peace with it like for years. Like I was like upset. I was like, well, like this fella is this fella, and they're all great. Like, and I'm mm. always the one, and I, like it's always like poor me. Like obviously yeah, I graded yeah. half it myself. But it took me a long time to get peace with it, like to go back to the cross and, and enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like, and I love going on a Friday night now. Yeah, like, yeah. Myself and Rocky go to the matches, like we sit in that shit in the shed of chips and curry, like for the match, yeah. do yeah. the whole fan thing. You have to enjoy it a bit more in a different way this, this yeah. time around. But like, that's what kind of killed me most was like Car- all the other clubs was were clubs, but like Cork City was kind of like my family, yeah, that kind of way. That's where yeah. it was, you know, all, all my yeah. family and friends, everybody went there. We all, and, uh, but it's nice now, pal, that I can kind of look at it and sit in it and go, oh, it's, you know, it's just like peace. Like, do you know what I mean? Everyone's finished now and somebody else's turn to get in trouble. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, so look, and that, that kind of brings us up to know when you're getting involved in the, the gym and stuff like that. So best of luck with that and hope the, the opening and the, you know, the, the, the success of it, I'm sure will be a great success. And, uh, you no, know, thanks, um, so that kind of brings us on there. We... Uh, Bringing us on to a couple of fans' questions, as I said, it was very popular this week amongst the fans. So, um, first one here from uh, League of Ireland Transfer News on Instagram: Best player you played with and against? Is this just in Ireland now or in England? Uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, doesn't um, have to be just Cork City. The the best one, the best one I played with, like, and, and I definitely said, with Flinny, like, uh, Flinny was definitely the best. Playing well. When Flynn done his knee against UCD like all those years ago, he just never got back to those heights he had before before that. Yeah. But uh, Flynn was Flynn was outstanding uh, footballer. Like so was Moz. I'm just gonna I'm not gonna repeat all the names because Joey yeah. did it last week, Roy did it the week before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, the uh, best player you played against? The best player I played against was Yossi Benayoum. Oh yeah. And Steven Gerrard was playing that day as well. Oh yeah. Yossi Benayoum was off the walls. Pal. Could not what, match. What game was that? 
I played in my first game for Tranmere. Okay. In, they, they were just after coming back, I think, from winning the Champions League. Right. And uh, Yossi Benayoung. I also, can I say, I'm not, I don't even like Liverpool, but um, I played against Michael Owen and Robbie Fowler in the FA Cup when right. they were proper, when Michael That's Owen was right. like world player of the year. Like, he was like off the wall rapid. Like, yeah, you know? yeah. So, like, I got to play. I got to play against a lot of players like that. I remember Stephen MacPhail was a fantastic footballer as well. Yeah. When I was being in the Irish squads when I was younger. Yeah. But uh, Yossi Ben Young was was definitely my best over there, and Flinny. Best, best to play with. Played with. So uh, PJOM seven two on Instagram. Biggest regret of your career. Sounds like you would have few f- f- maybe through that story, but maybe yeah. the one that you pinpoint that you think you could have done something differently or or so on. Um, I'd loads of regrets, things like, like you know what I mean, and like, yeah. like I, like I, and I, some days I like I sit there like and I think, oh my god, I, like, I, I had guilt over things with managers, like, and I think when I was a manager, I didn't help managers when I was at their clubs. Yeah, like my my biggest regret really, pal, was probably the way it all ended with Cork City, and if you think about it, these, in which, it, which time, in in two thousand and six, right, like because if if I stayed at Cork City. I probably would have been a legend for the rest of my life there. Like, I probably would have went down and won a load of stuff. Like, I went away to England. I know I kind of got back. I did nothing in England, really, in the end. Mm. So I, could have, I more or less should have just stayed at Cork City and I, I just carried on my career looking back. You know what I mean? But, you know, you don't have that advice and all that, and I wanted to go. But yeah. I think the way I left with Rico and that whole shambles was, uh, mm. it just it just wasn't right. Like, it was just, it was just ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jack Teagan on Instagram as well. Bo- best moment of your career? Um, I think I uh, know no, because not because it's a Cork City uh, podcast, but the night we won the league in the in the shed yeah. was off the walls. Yeah. So you know what I mean? We got to bring the, the trophy down into the shed. Um, like I watched that game for the first time only like four or five weeks ago. Oh yeah. Like, and if you watch that match, these I was so stressed at that match. Every corner, every set piece. I actually did no step overs or nothing that, that, that game. I actually played like a midfielder. Actually, it, 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 there was a bit of a cup final feel to it, wasn't there? You know, it was, yeah. it was cagey enough. Like, it was the first time. Like, I always played for the team, but it was the first time I really put myself. Because normally, if the TV cameras were there, I was like, Georgie, you got to do something special tonight. <laughs> it was the first night I didn't. I was like, no, man. I goes, I just have to win this game. I don't care what happens. Yeah. Me today, like, we have to win. Yeah, I know. I know. I was there that night myself. It was unbelievable. Like, you know, it was, yeah. it was a great night. But um, the next one there, the best manager you played for and why? Um, I'm not going to say Pat Dolan because I know he'll watch this and I don't want to give him credit, right? <laughs> um, I think, I think, looking back, Pat was Pat was a brilliant manager. But I think, as in proper at me, Pat, Jim Magilton was like the only one that I was really scared of. Right. I mean, like and like Jim used to actually train with us. He used to even coach us. Right. But like you did not mess with Jim, like you know what I mean. And like that kind of worked for me because I was from that environment. And Dean Wilkins at uh, Brighton, you know Ray Wilkins's brother. He was he was an unbelievable. You would have loved him though. He'd be one of your guys, proper football coach, all. Yeah. You know, real good good guy and do all his stuff. Like Brilliant. I suppose to come back, I say I'll take it back. I said Dean was probably the best, but oh, yeah? Pat, Pat was definitely the biggest influence. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I suppose it comes out of at different ways, really. But uh, you played some under some great managers for sure. Uh, your favorite goal for Cork City? Oh, um, the, my free kick against Shelburne. Yeah, oh, yeah. Out in the wing. You obviously enjoyed games against Shells, and even Roy touched on the last week. He had his own, uh, he had his own joys against Shelburne that time. It was it was a huge rivalry. I remember. I remember me, I was about, I think I was about 14, 15 at the time, and me and my friends used to try, there was one game we made sure we were going to every year, like it was the Shells away game, yeah. like it was, it was unbelievable, like, you know, the atmosphere, the, the players as well, like, you know, from City and even Shells then, like Wes and, and all them, like, you know, you know, it was something probably you'd appreciate enough at the time, really. Like. Uh, it, it was some crack. I used to love those games. Like, yeah. from, from the minute we walked out into the tunnel to on the pitch, it was yeah. just like no holds barred. Like it was just like, yeah. like here we go today. Like you know what I mean? It was, it was just I just love it. I used to be counting down the days to get them. Like yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. They they were good players though. They were good. They were good, and they were a good club at the time as well. They, they had yeah. good people involved in them. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so usually, as I said to you, we usually do with teammates, uh, Cork City teammates. But we're going to change it up a bit this week um, and do something a bit different because obviously, I'm conscious that we've had yourself, Roy, Joe. 
Fenny, Woodsy, all kind of players from the same era, and a lot of the answers are coming out similar. Poor Dennis is getting an awful time, so we're definitely <laughs> going to have to get Dennis on the next couple of weeks to get a bit of retribution against you. But, um, so what we're going to do this week is, right, since you're, you're um, one of the Ireland's best midfielders in the league, we're going to do a build your perfect midfielder with players that you played with and against. So we've seven categories and we'll go through them one by one and you pick the best player in each of these categories to, okay. to, to build the best midfielder, right? So the first one is passing. And obviously you can't pick yourself in any of these either. It has to be. Um, I think passing definitely be uh, Key Fahey. Key He's Fahey? The ball. Yeah. 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 He was, was he someone you played against the last in the league? We, we ended up playing against Gillard because he was kind of at Drogheda and like he's a fella like you know like his career went on to be a lot better than mine but uh, he um, you could tell when you played against him and I, I remember the last time I played against him just before he went to Birmingham we played against him at, um, at Richmond Park like, and he yeah. was brilliant yeah next one is strength oh strength uh, you gotta go Dan Murray man he's just a mountain isn't he midfielder though off as a midfielder, just oh, midfielders, yeah. no, just yeah. midfielder. So we're I building strength, the perfect midfielder. Strength, strength would be Alan Reynolds. Oh yeah, yeah, absolute beast. Uh, engine, uh, Joey Gamble. Yeah, he always looked after himself in that, and he was always fit. Yeah, I watched the match against your guys, and like you see the track and back he did in that game. Yeah, he was flying fit to be fair, wasn't he? Yeah. He bailed out Benno and Dan so <laughs> the after was. Uh, brain. So the best brain of a midfielder you've come across? Oh, brain. The best one, if I can say midfielder, was like a number 10. Remember Liam Coyle at Derry? Oh, yeah. Did he you play amazing. against him? I played against him, yeah, his last couple of years at, at Turner's Cross. He's and a name that obviously I wouldn't be familiar with, but he's always a name. I remember, especially when Paul Doolan was around and Tommy and that day. Oh, was just the reference. So he was obviously big in their time. They were saying like off the charts, basically. Yeah, like he, he he was basically like Keith Fahey, uh, um, oh who else? Paddy McCourt. He was like one of those guys, but he had a really bad knee injury. Right, like, okay. he could, and he was I think he was supposed to go to Man United, but he he was ended up playing with one leg, and he was still like ten times better than everyone else. Jeez, I would love to see maybe a few clips of him. So pace for a midfielder is obviously not their usual natural strength, but. Um, Pace, definitely, yeah. Roy O'Donovan's lightning. Yeah. Um, leadership. Oh, leadership. Do you know who was a good captain? Kevin Hunt at Bohemians. Yeah. Yeah, he kind of had them all going. He was there for a long time as well, wasn't he? Well yeah. respected, imagine He's the more. Annoying. Oh, still my head in the matches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tidy player, to be fair. Uh, goal scoring for a midfielder. Um, goal scoring. Using that many goal scoring midfielders back in the day, do we? <laughs> think of it. This is probably one you probably need to put yourself into. I'd imagine, is it? Yeah, goal scoring midfielder. Who scored goals out for midfield? Oh, um, Kevin D- was the lad. Was the lad from uh, Derry? Uh, Kevin Derry. Not Kevin Derry. The other guy, tall for the black hair. Kieran Martin, is it? Kieran Martin, yeah. yeah. Kieran Martin was always the one to get goals. Yeah. So that gives us... So passing key for his strength, Alan Reynolds, engine Joe Gamble, Brian, Liam Coyle, Pace, Roy, O'Donovan, leadership, Kevin Hunt, and goal scoring, Kieran Martin. Yeah. You happy with that? you never done skill. Skill, go on. I'll give you skill. You'd have to so. go Paddy McCord, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. He's another one that's mentioned a lot, like, isn't he? Yeah, everyone mentions Paddy. He was brilliant. Remember, uh, it was, who said it a couple of weeks ago? I don't know. It was Joe. We were playing Celtic out in the cross in a friendly. I think it was a bit of a fundraiser there a few years ago. And Paddy McCourt was the captain of Celtic at the time. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. Like, he was just un- unplayable. Like, you know. Yeah. And he looked through his YouTube clips. If there's any kids watching this, have a look at Paddy McCourt's YouTube clips. Ah, unbelievable. Like, something it? else. Like, yeah. Unbelievable. But uh, look, Georgie. Uh, as fascinating as I thought it was going to be anyway so thanks very much for that and, no uh, problem glad you're doing well and uh, as I said look best of luck with the with the business and uh, it's great as I said to see you around the car cross again for the last last year or two so hopefully we'll be back back soon again and uh, be out there cheering the team on again well pal thanks very much
No worries. So that concludes episode seven of City Talk. Thanks again to George for coming on with us this week. Next week, we will have Colin T. O'Brien, another ex-former former teammate of George and City legend and obviously Irish underage manager at the moment. So another interesting one there to get into next week. Uh, I'd like to thank Aaron Howey on production for putting us all together. Um, you can watch the podcast on our YouTube channel on Rebel Army TV and you can listen to it on SoundCloud, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts and also through our Cork City FC app. So that's it for this week. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, see you next week. Thank you.